One. Back on the Peter King podcast. So happy to be joined by Tyron Matthew, the Super Bowl champion safety of the Kansas City Chiefs. Tyron, that's got to sound good. You have a Super Bowl ring. What's your level of appreciation like for that? Well, Peter, it's good to see you. Um, I'm extremely appreciative. Um, you know, I'm, I'm appreciative uh, for, for the journey, you know, I've been on. Uh, more, I'm more grateful for the people that that really have stuck with me uh, throughout my journey, and, and even some of the people that I have met recently who have always watched from afar and who have always supported me. But now, you know, I have a chance to to really make history with those people. Um, you know, I'm 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 forever grateful for all those things. As you sort of get ready to open your season against the Houston Texans and get ready to defend a Super Bowl championship. What do you think is particularly difficult about trying to win again? And and I I think to myself, you know, you could have lost the playoff game to Tennessee. Yeah. You could have lost the Super Bowl to San Francisco. You're down 10 points with 8 minutes to go. So, it's not like you're a total steamroller just killing everybody, but now there's an even bigger X on your chest that everybody is going to be after. As you look at it right now, what is going to be really difficult on this journey you start against Houston? Well, I think first and foremost, you know, you, you, you have to find ways to stay motivated. Uh, I think for us, you know, as a team, I think we realize overall that we could be so much better. And I know last year, you know, we, we were able to kind of pull together and win the championship. But I think overall, the, the commitment is that we can be so much better, whether that be offense or whether that be defensively or even special teams wise. And then beyond that, it's taking it a step further. You know, I think, you know, here in Kansas City, we're, we're, we, we love to come to work, especially for Coach Reed. And I think that bond, that commitment that we have with one another um, we have to keep that. And, you know, it's going to be very difficult because not all of us are going to be able to, you know, congregate or bond outside of the football facility, just with so much that's going on in the world. And, you know, everybody's trying to protect their families and also protect the interests of the team. So um, it's going to be very difficult, but I think we have some of the right pieces in place um, to where we can, we can do this thing. Uh, we got some good leaders as far as coaches. I think coaches are so you know, underappreciated, you know, right? It's like, you know, if you got a great group of guys, then, you know, you could win a championship. But I think people tend to forget that, you know, coaches mean a lot to the football program. It's not always about having the best players on the team. And uh, I think we're very, very fortunate. I'll speak for me personally, you know, especially with Coach Spags and, you know, Coach Merritt, Brendan Daly, Matt House, all these guys with this great knowledge of football, um, you know, I'm appreciative for those guys as well because they they keep us committed. They keep us focused. They, they're constantly putting challenges in front of us um, and, and keeping us motivated. I want to go back and ask you one question about the Super Bowl. Um, with seven minutes and 13 seconds left in the fourth quarter, you guys were behind 20 to 10. You had a third and 15 at your own 35. Patrick was, uh, you know, getting chased all around. And this was not a normal third and 15. With their pass rush, I said, man, how, how are they going to convert this? And I wonder, take me into sort of when you're down 10, midway through the fourth quarter in the Super Bowl, tell me what's going through your mind at that moment and what do you remember about the 44-yard pass to Tyreek Hill? Well, I'd probably say, you know, just that that play in particular, um, you know, you have to have great trust between players and coaches. And, you know, I think Coach Reed allows that. You know, he allows for his players to to be fully embraced, um, to buy into what it is that that he's selling. And I think moments like that are critical um, when you talk about the camaraderie, the chemistry between players and coaches, right? Because if the game's on the line and it's a critical situation, you know, certain players want, want to run certain plays, you know, and not all the time do you get quarterbacks 
receivers and coaches on the same play on the same page and they want to run the same play and so and, and even beyond that you know being down in the fourth quarter um i think that's andy reed you know that's what he's prepared us for you know i can remember coming into camp and i'm telling myself i'm like man this is like one of the toughest and i consider myself a pretty tough football player i consider myself a football guy so it's like i'm not running from anything football related and but this was one of the toughest camps I've ever been a part of, you know, even practices throughout the season. You know, it's tough. It strains you uh, mentally, physically. But as I sat there in the fourth quarter of the Super Bowl and even the couple games that we had before that, you know, I realized individually and I'm sure my teammates as well was that we were prepared for this moment, you know, through all the practices we had through all the situations we go through and not just coach Reed, you know, he opens the floor to, to many different guys, you know, to, to kind of teach us the game, whether that be situational football, you know, down by two up by two scores. And so I just felt like we were so prepared and we were so comfortable. And I know that that doesn't sound great being down, but we were extremely comfortable in that situation because once again, I feel like our coaches really, prepared us for that moment. Um, you know, we weren't fatigued, you know, even though we were down, we weren't thinking, you know, slowly. Um, I feel like we were still ourselves and that's the only way you can kind of pull through. You have to dig back, you know, reach back into those moments in preseason, you know, during the season, you know, when your coaches were challenging you when your coaches were expecting a lot out of you. And I think that's what we did. And I think that's how we were able to really pull through. What you just said reminds me so much of what Tom Brady told me after they had the massive comeback against Atlanta. They're down 28-3 in the Super Bowl. He brings them back. They end up winning the Super Bowl greatest comeback in history. Mm -hmm. And I said, Tom, in the fourth quarter and overtime of this game, you threw the ball consistently to Malcolm Mitchell a guy who basically was in the middle of his cup of coffee in the NFL. Okay. You know, he lasted a year, maybe a year plus. And Chris Hogan, who is a receiver, who he's a good receiver, but he's not a franchise receiver. And I said, time after time, after time, you're throwing these little stop routes, these curls, and you're throwing the ball and it's right where it's supposed to be. And the guy stops and he turns around the balls right on him and all that stuff. I said, these are kind, these are new guys. Yeah. What is it? And he said, Peter he said, it's 111 practices. <laughs> and you know, if I can't get into a great groove and communication with my guys after practicing with them and then staying after practice, probably a hundred of those, you know, <laughs> I, 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 you know, that's really, that's on me. We haven't worked hard enough. And that's what that play to Tyreek Hill reminded me of, yes. you know, he knows exactly, you know, he's got to sprint at the safety. He's got to cut over and Mahomes has to know exactly when he's going to throw it. Yes. And I, I mean, I think about that play a lot. I just think it was, it said so much about your team, yes. about Mahomes, about Tyreek Hill. And how about this? Okay. Yes. So I know everybody is sad that Eric B is not a head coach in the NFL. I get it. And of course he should be a head coach in the NFL, but how about this year when Patrick Mahomes comes to the sidelines, he's got Mike Kafka to bounce stuff off. He's yeah. got Eric, his quarterback coach, Eric B is offensive coordinator. And of course he's got Andy Reed. That to me, if somebody says, what do you need to repeat? I said, I'll take that brain trust, you know, <laughs> And like you're you're right with Spagnola. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's so interesting about it. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, I want to ask you about your career and your life. Okay. So I think for people who don't know you and don't really know your story, okay, you were kicked off the LSU football team in 2012 due to violation of team rules. OK, and then you basically uh, you were in and out of it seems like you were kind of in and out of Les Miles doghouse, you know, for a lot of that year. Yeah. Then you entered the draft early. You didn't go as high in the draft. 
as you wanted to go. And I, I wonder, I think you're 69th overall pick. Yes. And at that time, I remember going to Cardinals training camp and all that. And I said to uh, Steve Keim, the GM, and Bruce Arians, I said, man, that's kind of a risky pick with Tyron Matthew. You know, a lot of people are staying away from him because of his off-field issues. So, but I think what's so interesting now is you basically walked into the Kansas City Chiefs and you became easily one of the most important team leaders on the team. So I want you to take me back in your life and tell me why what was happening in 2012 didn't ruin your life and why you were able to make the comeback that you did. Well, yeah, I think, you know, just thinking back on it, Peter, you know, um, I was focused on things that, you know, I wasn't truly, you know, here to do, you know, and I think a lot of that comes with football. I think a lot of that comes with having great success, um, especially in Louisiana. You know, LSU is everything in, in Louisiana. And I think for a lot of kids, you can get to that point and you can feel like you've become who you've always wanted to become, not realizing you have so much more in you, so much more, you know, to look forward to. And I think for me, you know, after I had that experience of, you know, letting teammates down, you know, letting coaches down, uh, letting the community down, letting the state of Louisiana down, you know, I realized it was time for Tyron to just focus back on, you know, what it was that I loved to do. And I think that was being a great teammate and, you know, just playing football and, and, and obviously serving my community. You know, I've always felt like I was a guy that, you know, was willing to, to do for others. And so, you know, I just tried my best to focus on that, um, especially then I think when I came into the NFL, you know, I had, you know, such great support. Right. I had guys that I can truly count on. Right. Like guys that I can look at and say, that's how it's done. You know, and, you know, whether that be Pat P, um, whether that be Patrick Larry, Peterson, Patrick yeah. Peterson, whether that be Larry Fitzgerald, you know, Darnell Dockett, uh, Calais Campbell. I was surrounded by some good men, some good dudes. And all those guys were different in their own right. And but but I, I tried my best to take something, you know, from all of those guys moving forward. Um, but I think ultimately it was about me just focusing on the things that, you know, in my mind, I was put on this earth to do. And, you know, that's to play football, serve my community and then really push my teammates to, to be the best that they can be. And I didn't always realize the effect of that. Like, you know, obviously, when you get to the National Football League, people, you know, they emphasize the fact that you're the guy breaking down huddles and you're the guy speaking to the team. But I, I took a step back and I realized I've always been that guy, you, you know, that, that my teammates really listen to. And so it was for me to just, you know, put both of my hands in a pile. You know, I felt when I was, you know, 18, 19, I, I had one hand in the pile. And then the other hand was kind of, you know, I wanted to enjoy the perks of, you know, being who I was becoming. And so for me, it was it was time to just kind of, you know, refocus on that. And I never really thought I was a bad kid. You know, even though I had some bad experiences, um, you know, uh, but it was definitely things that that I that I learned, um, things that I grew from. Um, you know, even sitting across from Coach Miles and me and Coach Miles had a great relationship outside of the things that I was doing off the field, and to just see that hurt in his eyes. Now, this is a man who who didn't raise me. He he, you know, he's not my 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 family. You know, he he's a coach who's coming to my life, but he. You know, he sees something great in me that I still don't see in myself. And, you know, I think in that meeting, I realized that, wow, you know, I, I, I am a pretty good kid who was doing things the right way. And now look at me hurting people that were really trying to, you know, make me become, you know, who I really wanted to become. So uh, I think ultimately it was about me just focusing, you know, on the things that I love to do rather than, you know, things that I that I like to do. Did you worry back then that you might become a statistic like so many people who grew up hard uh, in New Orleans and, and all? I mean, look, and grew up hard anywhere. Did you worry you'd become a statistic? Absolutely. I think that really pushed me. I think that still pushes me to this day. Uh, I think I, because I understand that, you know, at any given moment, I can, you know, be back in New Orleans. I can be back in a situation that, you know, I've tried my best to grow from. 
you know, I can never forget, you know, when I got kicked out of school, it was so many people that, that, that I loved, that I grew up with, who just simply was trying to tell me to, to go get a regular job, to, to go do something else in my life, that football wouldn't work. And, you know, for me, it would, they didn't, they didn't realize, you know, the kind of love I had for the game. And I think that's a secret ingredient as well. You know, I think earlier I called myself a real football guy and I am. Um, and I think that's part of that is what saved me as well. You know, understanding, cause I've always played football, you know, because I love to play with my teammates. I love to celebrate with them. I love to make big splash plays. You know, I love to get my coaches excited. And so, you know, uh, you know what I, you know, what I learned that, uh, I remember, remember when I came to Arizona and did a story for NBC about you playing all the different positions. I remember coming away. And so for people who never saw that, basically I went in and, and I walked through all of Tyron Matthews jobs in the course of a Sunday, you know, you're playing corner, you're playing the slot, you're playing safety, you're playing box linebacker. You, you know, you, you had all these jobs to do. And I remember I was on the phone with one of my bosses at NBC and they said, how was, how was Tyron Matthew? I said, I, I cannot believe he's got to know like five foreign languages. <laughs> he's got to know as much as Carson Palmer knows. <laughs> he has to know as much. And so I always thought, and you tell me about this. I thought that Arizona was a perfect place for you because of all the multiple stuff they did on defense. Yeah. And because Bruce Arians totally fell in love with you. Yeah. And Bruce Arians, uh, you know, I don't know. The way Arians talked about you was like you're his son. He just absolutely loved you. He loved the kind of player you were. And I remember Arians said to me one time, he goes, people don't really know this guy. He said, people would love this guy if they knew him. And I, I just, that's why your career kind of fascinates me because you kind of came back from the depths and you've had this multiple career with multiple teams. It's just been kind of a cool run. Tyron's coming back in. He just uh, okay. He just said he had an internet issue. I think he's going to try to get in on his phone uh, to finish it out. So that's good. Yeah, Thanks, I, I literally I was going to say I I was going to ask him the last question because oh. we were at we were at nineteen minutes. <laughs> Perfect. Well, yeah, he'll uh, he'll come on. He he should be jumping on here in a second. So okay, good. He just he just called me. <laughs> There we go. Hey, I'm sorry about that. That's okay. It's all good. Listen, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick up where we left off. Okay. And it's I, I this, it's the last thing I wanted to ask you about anyway, okay? Okay. All yes. right. Uh, three, two, one. Finishing up with Tyron Matthews. So what leads you to believe, if anything, that this – you know, that this 2020 season where you guys are going to try to repeat, what leads you to believe that you guys have what it takes 
to win another Super Bowl? Yeah, uh, you know, Peter, beyond just having, you know, some of the, the best players, you know, in the world, you know, at, at key positions, you know, um, I truly believe we have the best coaching staff in the National Football League. Uh, I, I truly believe that they take on the same challenges as the players. You know, I feel like it's an equal um, shared responsibility. And, you know, that's what I love about, you know, our coaches, uh, especially Coach Spags. You know, if each and every day he's not only challenging us, he's challenging himself to, to, to be the best that he can be. And, you know, even coming into this season, you know, you know, he's putting certain challenges in front of me to make me a better player so that I don't get complacent. And, and it's not just Tyra Matthew. It's all of his players. You know, he's hands-on. And um, I, I think I'm, I'm so fortunate to, to have a coach like that, to, to be so hands-on, not just, you know, with me, but, you know, these are guys that understand all three levels of the defense, you know. And then if you talk about Coach Reed, it's, he understands offense inside and out. And I think when you have coaches that you can truly rely on as a player, you know, you're not just relying on your athletic ability. You know, you understand that you're going into these situations. You're going into games with all the knowledge that you have, with all the motivation that you have. And, you know, I talked about practice, you know, and how our practices are and, you know, how much is, is expected of us each and every day. And so I think all those things uh, are going to help us, you know, beyond, you know, us just scoring 30 points a game and defensively trying our best to pick up where we left off last season. You have much of a gut feeling, Tyron, about whether a COVID football season can work, whether you're going to be able to make it for the next five months. I mean, it's it, it almost seems impossible to think that there's not going to be some major outbreak. But as a player, what do you think? As a player, I'm very optimistic. Um, uh, I'm hoping for the best. You know, and I think coming into camp this year, um, you know, seeing the setup, seeing the protocol, you know, seeing how strict and stern, you know, um, the NFL is and the NFL PA is about, you know, just certain guidelines to protect everyone. And, you know, I truly believe in it because not always do people continue to kind of, you know, some, you know, after two, three weeks of camp, people just kind of let it all fall. You know, they start doing their own thing, you know, people not wearing masks, but, I don't think that's the case. I think this is going to be something that that all of us uh, are going to be responsible for. Um, will we have ups and downs? I, I, I believe so. Uh, but I think overall, uh, we have some of the best people, you know, um, working for us, giving us the right kind of safety tips. And I, I truly believe that will help us, um, along with the players you know, truly understanding their responsibility, not only to themselves and to their families, but to the team. You know, I truly believe that, you know, football is a sport that, that unites people. You know, I, if I look into the stands, I see many different faces. I see many different colors of people. Um, and all these people are enjoying a good moment. They're enjoying a great football game. Um, whether they're rooting for the opposite team or not, it's it's a bonded moment that, that we all share um, as fans of the game, you know, as players of the game. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that. I truly believe football can 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 really lift the people uh, in, in this country in, in such a great time. So that's that's the reason I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm hoping that we can that we can really play this thing in full and, and, and give people something to be to be proud of, to, to be happy about it. And, and um, in the meanwhile, hopefully we could bring another championship back to Kansas City. You know, it's it's interesting when you're in a new place. I wonder. I've always thought of Kansas City when I go there, man, if they win a Super Bowl, this this will be one of the happiest places on earth. Have you felt that in the off season? you know, going around town? Do people what do people say to you about about either thanking you or, or whatever? What it what has it been like to be in that community, even in this weird COVID time. It's been so great. Um, you know, these people are so um, supportive. Uh, they're so invested, you know, in Kansas City football. And, you know, it means a lot to me to, to represent something like that. I think if anybody knows me, they, they, 
they understand that I'm all. I always wanted to be a part of something like that. I'm all about family. I'm all about team. And I think just the fans in Kansas City, the people of Kansas City, the genuine support for the organization, not just football, but for even outside of that. Um, you know, even when we were going through uh, some of the protest things and, and different things that that we had to to address this summer, uh, a lot of these people were, were very supportive, uh, very reasoning, and so I'm thankful for that. And but I can just remember the the Super Bowl parade, you know, and, and seeing all those people out there. And uh, just the other day, you know, I went to the store to grab uh, some lunch uh, for our teammates. And um, as I'm leaving the store, um, I run into a guy who who hasn't been in Kansas City in 30 years. He was born and raised here. He left. He came back. But the first thing he told me was, "Wow, you know, I wish my dad was here to see you guys win that Super Bowl." And so for me, it's probably thousands and millions of people who who have that same, you know, love. They they have that same experience and, you know, they simply just want to see Kansas City win. And so I'm grateful that, that we really have the coaching staff, the players to really to really be competitive and to really to really do our best for the people of Kansas City. Tyron Matthew, good luck uh, this year starting against the Houston Texans. Uh, for a lot of reasons, this is going to be one of the most fascinating football seasons of, of your life, I'm sure. Yes, sir. Thank you, Peter. Good to see you. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.